John chapter 15, verse 22, Jesus makes a statement that kind of explains what his purpose was here upon the earth. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. And by saying this, Jesus is showing by his coming into the world that he has done two things. Number one, by declaring the complete will of God, he has exposed everyone's sin. He's finished what God had started, or what the Lord had started, in the first testament and thereby coming and, and, and teaching and preaching and by giving us the new covenant he has simply given us everything we need to know about what constitutes sin and secondly he's, by dying on the cross he provides the remedy for those sins so you have the exposure of sins you have the remedy for sins we have the conviction of sins before we can have the forgiveness of sins. We look at the life of Jesus and we see that everything he done, everything that he had done, he had done to expose this great rift between man and God that was even there for so many of the Jewish nation who claimed to be the children of God. So he gives that. If I had not come, he says, they wouldn't have known. They wouldn't be guilty of, of sin, but they'd still be lost. They'd still be lost. They'd be lost because we can't know. They couldn't know everything about sin. They would not have been guilty of sin, but now, now they have no excuse for sin. So for the sake of our understanding, let's pretend that Christ did not come into this world. How would our world be Different? How would our lives be different if Christ did not come? I've got about seven things I want to talk about. So number one, if Christ did not come, the law of Moses would not have been fulfilled. Now, it's supposing that if, if Christ did not come, uh, there wouldn't have been an, an Old Testament. But there was an Old Testament, and if Christ hadn't come, it wouldn't have been fulfilled. We learn a lot from the Old Testament, from the law of Moses. We learn about the fact that God created us. We learn what God expects of us in a mutually caring relationship. Now, the Jews missed it because they became people who just wanted to do the law, do the rituals and such. And they prided themselves in keeping the law, even though that Jesus exposed their sins because they, in, in, in keeping the law, the letter of the law, they forgot the spirit of the law. And they forgot to be faithful and merciful and just, all of those things. So they were really failing in a lot of ways. But yet, we find what God expects of us when we read about those Old Testament characters who lived a good life in spite of the fact that they had a limited knowledge or understanding of God. We know the great heroes of faith. And again, go to Hebrews chapter 11. You see them listed there. And the writer says, uh, if we had more time, we'd talk about some more of them. But, but he didn't have the time to put them all in there. But there are so many who, in a limited ability, a limited knowledge of God, were able to live lives that were pleasing to God. So uh, there'd be no reason for the law of Moses if Christ was not being foretold. Because it foretells of him, he becomes that capstone, the, the, the finishing of the old law to become the cornerstone of the new law. And it's just not a bunch of laws. It is a complete understanding of who God is, who and what we are as human beings, and how we really truly need to respond to God so we can truly be his children. So the law of Moses gives us a good, solid understanding of God. Now, if we had the law of Moses today and Christ did not come, we would be under a galling yoke, a 
burden that the Jews couldn't keep is what we're told in the New Testament. Acts chapter 15, when, when talking about, well, do the Jews need to become, or do the Gentiles need, need to become Jews in order to become Christians? You know, and the, the remarks being made there at the conference in Jerusalem was, we couldn't even keep it. Why would we want to impose that on those people? Now we have something that's complete. Now we have something that we can follow because forgiveness is there in its entirety. It, it's a new way. It's based on love. It's not based on fear. See? The Old Testament was based on fear. You fear God. You fear God. You fear God. Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. But see, when Jesus came, now there's a little different twist on it. Perfect love casts out fear. We have no reason to be afraid of God. Yes, we need to respect Him, but no reason to fear Him. He's not like a, 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 an evil tyrant. He's like a loving Father, and He desires the very best for, for us and treats us in that way. So the Jews who took pride in the law, they couldn't even keep the law. They didn't know where it was leading. Jesus said that the two greatest commandments was to love God and to love our neighbors. And if we could do that, then we could, we could do the law. But the problem was, they looked for the loopholes, they looked for the ways around it, they looked for the shortcuts, and it became galling for them because they didn't want to look and find out where it was leading them. Again, Acts 15, 20, or 15, 10. Now therefore, why do we why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So Jesus came, took that harsh, hard to obey law, and fulfilled it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. Now, if it's fulfilled, it's not destroyed. He, he wasn't trying to tear it down and put something new in its place. He was, in the fulfillment of the law, graduating it into something that could be worldwide and everybody could follow. He nailed the law and its curse to the cross, Colossians 2, 14. Cursed is every man who hangs on trees, what the law of Moses said. And what did he do? He hung on the tree. He hung on the cross. But in hanging on the cross, what did he do? He cursed the law by nailing it to the cross. Now, it say that he cursed it, but what he did, he fulfilled it and gave us something that we could know and understand. Remove that galling yoke. And in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 11. Anyway, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Not the yoke of the old law, see? Not even the yoke of the patriarchal law. Take my yoke upon you and come and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Okay? This is not a galling yoke. His commandments are not intolerable. They're not hard to do if we start out on the basis of loving God and loving one another. But see, if Christ hadn't come and that law was there, then that would be our only hope. And it would be such a slim hope. Because all the hope of the law of Moses was based upon the Messiah coming and dying upon the cross as that sacrifice for sin. Second thing we've noticed that if Christ did not come, there would be no atonement for sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. And that by whose stripes you are healed is a quote from Isaiah chapter 53. The perfect picture of the suffering servant coming and dying, a, a, a martyr's death on our behalf, and, and becoming that sacrifice for our sins. Now, if you look at the word atonement, 
It's a strange word, but in the English language, it's broken down. It's a kind of theological term, and it's at one -ment. at one -ment. Now, if you look at Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, it's our sins that separate us from God. So if we're separated from God because of our sins, we're not at one with God. But because Jesus died upon the cross, we can have the forgiveness of sins and we can be at one with God. Now see, because of what he's done, there's a, an at-one-ment with God. We return to fellowship with him as John talks about in 1 John, the whole, the whole book there. What does he say? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now that propitiation means it, it's the pleasing part. It, it's what pleases God, that propitiation. You have expiation where, you know, if you get caught speeding through town and you go to the, to the court or down to the city building, whatever, and you pay your fine, you've expiated for that. But the propitiation means somebody does it for you. And that's what Jesus did. He gave that sacrifice for sins for us so that we don't have to die for our sins. We can live to righteousness. And it comes from the concept, remember back in those Old Testament sacrifices, uh, an example for Noah, when Noah offered those clean animals after he came out of the ark, and it says that there was a sweet-smelling savor that arose to God. And that's what that propitiation God was pleased with it. God was pleased with Christ's sacrifice for us. Not that it smelled good, but it was the right thing that by the right person for the right thing and all the right reasons. And it completed that concept that man can be back at one with God. And see, what we're told is that when we are baptized for the forgiveness of sins, say, forgiveness of sins gone, what happens? We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's our connection. The down payment for the eternal at one with God that we'll have later on. What a wonderful thing it is, the concept. But see, we wouldn't have that if Christ hadn't come because nobody else could do it but Him. Everything pointed to Him. Third, if Christ had not come, there would be no redeeming gospel. There'd be no buying back the gospel. Say, we were gods at one time, but then because of sin, we became slaves of Satan, sin and death. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The redeeming gospel. When, when we hear and obey the gospel, our sins are forgiven. We are at one with God. We are redeemed. We're bought back. Ephesians 1, 7, he purchased us with his own blood. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7, that tells us what happens if we reject that gospel. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them, or on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obeying the gospel, when the gospel's preached, means Repent, be baptized, confess in Christ. Yeah, it means all that, but that's not the end of it. See, the gospel, as Jesus gave it in Matthew, go all into all the world, preach the gospel. Or, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. There are so many in the church today that believe if all, if all they do is be baptized, they're going to be saved. Where did they learn that from? Well, they learned it from the denominational world. You know, just believe you'll be saved and you can't be lost. Living 
for Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis is just as much the gospel as getting somebody in the water. Because it calls for a new birth. It calls for a new life. So if Christ hadn't come, there'd be no redeeming gospel. Just that galling yoke that nobody could do, not even the Jews. Number four, if Christ had not come, there would be no universal invitation. And there it is, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, coming to be all you labor and are heavy laden. See, we wouldn't have that if Jesus hadn't come, because there would be no easy yoke. It's not that Jesus' yoke is easy. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him pick up his cross daily and come and follow me. Unless we're willing to crucify self, self on a day-to-day -day basis, we can never get in the yoke of Christ. It won't work. We can't get in the yoke with Christ and make ourselves the most important thing in the world. We have to have a proper understanding of our sins. But what did Jesus say? The second greatest commandment, and love your neighbor as yourself. If we don't have a proper love of ourselves, we can't love our neighbor. And if our love is only for ourselves, we'll never love our neighbor, and we can't be right with God. We can't get in to that yoke with him. So. We, we've got to take on that yoke. We've got to crucify self. We've got to crucify the old man of sin. We've got to stop living by excuses and start living by knowledge of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That, that's so easy, isn't it? Yeah, that's easy. Crucifying self is the difficult part of it. But that we must do if we are to proceed along with Christ in his yoke. Number five, if Christ had not come, there'd be no golden rule. Now, that's what the law and the prophets was aiming for, wasn't it? That you would love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have others to do unto you. For this is, this is what the law and the prophets was teaching. They missed it. They missed it. How did they miss it? How did they miss something like that? Well, it's because you actually had to read it. And you had to study it. And you had to take it into your heart, and then you had to apply it. But see, they weren't even reading it. The scriptures didn't mean anything to them. We're, we're the children of Abraham. See, we talked about that this morning, didn't we? We're the children of Abraham. I said, God can raise up descendants, seed from Abraham out of the rocks. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good to say, I'm a child of Abraham. If you don't act like Abraham, and I'm not, I mean, good stuff like we talked about this morning. See? And in the same way, understand, if we claim to be the children of God, we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, wouldn't it seem logical that we need to be like Jesus Christ in our lives? To actually be in the yoke with Him? To be learning of him? What did he say? Come and learn of me. When so, well, that's after you get in the yoke. Baptism puts us in the yoke, right? But see, after that, then we've we got to learn of him. But so many times, we just want to do what we want to do. Forget about it. Well, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. In other words, it was an equalizing statute. Or you want to call it a principle. Say, some man might say, well, you know, I don't mind. I wouldn't mind coming and talking to your wife and going to bed with her. So what I want to do, you ought to want to do. This is not a moral principle, is it? 
It's an ethical principle based upon the law. And if you want people to treat you right, you better treat them right. Because eventually people are going to get tired. Number six. If Christ did not come, there would be no place prepared for us in heaven. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he'd been telling his disciples, I'm going to die. This is the time. Things are kept happening really fast now. You need to pay attention. You need to be strong. In fact, a little later on, he takes them to the garden and he says, you watch and you pray. And what did they do? They fell asleep. They could care less. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's what Jesus told them. Oh, good. Jesus, you've gone to prepare a place for me. Go get it ready. Do you understand what Jesus had to do to get it ready? Yeah, so it's just going to be easy for us. All we have to do is just sit back and wait for Jesus to come and get us and take us to our home. That didn't work for anybody throughout the scriptures, did it? It doesn't. It can't happen that way. If he hadn't come, there'd be no place prepared for us. But listen, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. We better be getting serious about it because the time's getting shorter, isn't it? Every day is a day closer to eternity if not facing death, for Jesus coming back. We need to get serious about the lives that we live if we expect him to come and take us home with him. And number seven, if Christ did not come, there would be no gain in death. There would be no gain in death. So Jesus said, or I'm sorry, Paul said, that uh, if we fail to believe, if there is no resurrection, if we choose to believe that, yeah, let's, let's go back to that. See, we're, we're talking about if Christ had not come. If Christ had not come and there was no resurrection, then we would have no hope and we'd be like all, uh, of all men most to be pitied because we actually believe that, that somehow we can do enough good works that somehow God would save us. The resurrection says it isn't about good works. Though, if we're born again, we'll do the good works. It'll become part of our character. Why? Because it's born into us. It, it's begotten into us by God. But if Christ hadn't come, there'd be no gain in death. Death would be a victor. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He shall reign until he puts the last enemy under his feet. The last enemy is death. death. See, in eternity, there's no death anymore. If we go to heaven... We're going to be there eternally. There'll be no death in heaven. Guess what? If we end up in hell, there'll be no death there either. It'll be eternal punishment. Death is going to be destroyed. There's no need for it anymore. But it's eternal death in the sense that it is a separation from God for eternity. But because Christ came, there is a gain in death. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ. To die is gain. If we're not living for Christ now, every day, there'll be no gain in death for us. It's like the Apostle Paul. Living is for Christ. Living is for him. Not for ourselves. Not even for other people. Though, as we live for Christ, the expression of our love for God will be toward others.
I wish John Jarvis was here tonight. Uh, last week he mentioned a book that, after my sermon, What Made the Wise Men Wise, he suggested an old book that, that I might read. It's uh, The Story of the Other Wise Man. Okay? And I, I found it I found it in free books, and then I found it in LibriVox, which is audio books. Okay? And yesterday, Karen and I listened to the first part of it on the way to Tampa, and we listened to the second part on the way home. And what an interesting story it is. Because here's this other wise man, he, he, he got behind, he had gifts to bring to Jesus, but he got behind the other three, and by the time he got to Bethlehem, Christ was already gone, say. And, but as the story goes through, the, he was late getting to those men because he stopped to help somebody. And in helping this person, one of the gifts that he had, not whether it was the sapphire or the ruby, he gave that to the person so that they could find help for what they needed. He'd come along and eventually there was somebody else that needed some help and he gave this, the ruby to. Ruby, sapphire, let's see. And when he finally gets to the point where he's caught up with Jesus, it's 33 years later and Jesus is being led through the streets to be crucified. And a woman comes to him, help me, help me. And she gives him this story. And finally he takes the last gift, the pearl, out and gives to her. And the pearl has the luster of the ruby and the sapphire with it. The precious jewels, see. And he, the, the narrator, as he's talking, so, reflecting the author, says, I, I, I was reminded of the pearl of great price and how that uh, if you have those precious gems and they're held together in the bosom, the warmth of the heart, the warmth of the bosom can transfer the luster from one to another. But he gave her that last gift he had for Jesus and he was upset. I've got nothing to give Jesus. I've got nothing to give him. And then he figured out that teaching of Jesus from Matthew chapter 25. When you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's what Jesus was after the whole time, wasn't it? That we would serve one another in His place. Many times it's not what we give to Jesus. It's what we give to the least of these, His brethren. It's going to make a difference in our lives, the type of people that, that we are going to be. There is gain for the Christian in dying, but only if our life is lived for Christ. Jesus, through his word, exposes sin in our lives, but he also provides the remedy for the sin Believe in his word, repent of your sins, be baptized in his name for the remission of sins. This constitutes the new birth. Jesus said we all have to go through it, say, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a doctor of the law and sat on the Sanhedrin. And he said, how can this be? Can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born again? And Jesus says, you're a doctor of the law and you don't understand this? And they understood it because that's what they told the Gentiles, say, to become Jews in the proselyting process, you've got to be born again as a Jew. Jesus said, we have to be born but not do circumcision and learning the law of Moses and doing all those rituals and stuff. We have to be born by water and the Spirit. Not just water. Not just water. We have to be born by the Spirit of God to be a changed people, a different people. As Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a new creation because if we're just the same old people we were before we were baptized then we weren't born again we just got wet let's see a 
constant exposure to the teachings of Jesus Christ will help us to understand where we truly are in our relationship to God. If Christ did not come, none of that would be possible. But he came, and it's possible, and we can be a part of it if we believe and obey. If we're born again in a spiritual way. Thank you for your time. The lesson is yours. If you have need this evening, we ask that you come on and make your request be made known. So we stand and sing the invitation song.